Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to my statistics video tutorial. In this one video, you're going to learn pretty much everything you're going to need to know statistics-wise to be able to understand data science and machine learning. Now, I have a previous video, which I have a link to in the description on probabilities, and if you watch both videos, you will have a really strong grasp on statistics and probabilities. Now, statistics is the science of collecting and analyzing data taken from a sample population. And the population is going to represent all items or people of interest in what you're analyzing. A sample is a subset of the population that we can analyze. And we mainly focus on successes or results we are looking for in a sample. Examples of this would be things like age, uh, whether somebody is a car owner or not, whether somebody is a college graduate or not, sex, whether they're a homeowner, etc. And in this diagram you're looking at here, the uppercase M is going to represent the successes in the population. Uppercase N is the total population. Lowercase s represents the successes in the sample. And lowercase n is going to represent the total sample from the population. Now, there are many different types of data. Categorical data is going to describe what makes a thing unique, like, for example, age, or whether somebody is a car owner, or sex, or whether they're a graduate, or simply any answer to a yes or no question. And as you're watching this video tutorial, pause your way through it and write down notes. And if you do that, you will have like an awesome cheat sheet that you can use to really, really understand this topic. Numerical data is either going to be finite, meaning that it has an ending value, or infinite, meaning the opposite. It has no ending value. Continuous data is data that can be broken down into infinitely smaller amounts. So you can think of things like distance and height and weight. You can constantly break them down into smaller and smaller units. Qualitative data can be either nominal, meaning that it is named data. It is mainly data for naming something which doesn't have an order. For example, race would be an example because there are many different races, but there is no order to them. Ordinal data is also named, but it has an order. And then examples of that would be things like bad, okay, good, or great. And then we have quantitative data, and it is like a ratio or interval being an amount between two defined amounts. For example, you could say pick a number between 8 and 16. That, that would be an example of quantitative data. Now, there are many different ways to visualize data. This is what we call a cross table, and it shows relationships between rows and columns of data. Frequency shows how often something happens. And here we can see that when we sampled 100 random men, that 78 were men that did not exercise. With pie charts, each slice is going to represent a category, and the size of the slice is going to represent its frequency. And mainly what differentiates it from other charts is that it must always equal 100%. Bar charts have bars that represent the categories, and the bar's length is going to represent the frequency. Now, Pareto charts are going to list categories in descending order, and they are also going to include a line that represents the cumulative frequency or the sum of all of the other frequencies that preceded. A frequency distribution table is going to focus on the number of occurrences or the frequency. And here what we're doing is we list a range of test scores and how many students scored in that range. A histogram is going to differ from a bar chart or a bar graph in that histograms are going to show the distribution of grades in a range and in this example versus using categories like we do with a bar graph. And also, histograms are drawn with the bars touching. 
Now the mean or average is going to provide an average value by summing all values and dividing by the number of components. And mu, the symbol mu, this guy right here, is used to represent the mean of the population. X bar is going to represent the mean of a sample, and you should definitely be writing these things down. And while it can be very useful, meaning the mean or the average, often outliers are going to dramatically affect your results. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 has a mean of 3, which looks like it makes sense. However, 1, 2, 3, 4, 100 is going to have a mean of 22 which could cause some issues. And I'm gonna provide a ton of examples of how we can use all these things very soon. Now the median is going to try to eliminate the influence of outliers by returning the number at the center of the data set. And if you have an even number of components instead, it's going to take the two center values and return the average of those two values. The mode is going to return the value that occurs the most often. If components occur at an equal rate, however, there is no mode meaning there are no double values. In that situation, there's no mode. And if there are multiple values that occur at the same frequency, in that situation, you would have more than one mode. Variance is going to measure how data is spread around the mean. And there is both a symbol for variance of the population, which is this guy right here, as well as another symbol that represents the variance for a sample, which you can find right here. And to find it, we first calculate the mean, and then we sum all sample values minus the mean squared. Then we divide by the number of samples minus one in a situation in which we are calculating a variance from a sample versus the entire population, which is what we'll almost always do. If we instead had data on the entire population, we would not include this minus one part here. And you can see right here, if we calculated using this sample right here and our variance formula, that this sample would give us a total variance of 2.5. Now, because we square values with variance, that's gonna give us some extra weight with our outliers. And for this reason, we find the square root of the variance to find what is called the standard deviation. That's what the standard deviation is. It is just simply the square root of the variance. And in situations in which the standard deviation is large, that means that the numbers are more spread out. And when the standard deviation is smaller, that means that the results or the samples are closer to the mean. Now the coefficient of variation is gonna be used to compare two measurements that operate on different scales. So what I'm doing here is comparing miles to kilometers. Three miles is approximately equal to 4.8 kilometers. Now even though they measure the same distance because they use different units, that is not seen whenever we calculate our standard deviation. As you can see right here, we have a standard deviation for miles, which is 0.645, and a standard deviation for kilometers, which is 1.038. That can cause some issues. However, if we come in and we divide by the mean, which you can see, mean for miles, mean for kilometers, we can see that they actually have the same exact dispersion, and that works out to 0 0.1721. Very useful information that we'll be using as the tutorial continues. Now, covariance is going to tell us if two groups of data are moving in the same direction, meaning they are correlated together or they just simply influence each other. And here, what I'm going to do is compare whether earnings are going to affect the market capitalization of a corporation. Market capitalization, just a big word for the total value of a corporation. Now you're gonna make this calculation by plugging in the values, minus their mean, and then multiply. This guy right here means sum. So you're going to go through, get each individual value of x, minus the mean of the total of x, and then multiply that times each individual value of y, minus the mean of all the values of y. And then you're going to divide by 
the number of samples, minus 1, and if you do that, you will get a value of 5,803. Now, if the value is greater than zero, that means those values are moving together. If they are instead less than zero, that means they are moving in opposite directions. And zero just means that they are completely independent. And as the tutorial continues, I'm going to show you way better ways to calculate how samples are influencing upon each other. We're gonna get into something called regression. And before I get into a bigger example, I'll talk about the correlation coefficient. And what it does is it adjusts the covariance so that it is easier to see the relationship between X and Y. And its value can't be greater than one or less than negative one. And the closer you get to one, the closer the relationship between the values. And in this example, what we're doing is we're plugging in the standard deviations of the market cap as well as earnings. And whenever we do this, we get a value of 0 0.6601. And what that means is they are correlated. Perfect correlation would have a value of one, zero shows independence, and once again, negative values show an inverse correlation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take all these different things that we've been talking about and show you how extremely powerful they are in a real world situation. Okay, so let's say a company comes to you, you're a data scientist, and they say we have all this information about sales, who we, what companies we sold to, our contact information, the sex, the age, where we sold it, what exactly we did sell it, what type of computer we sold, sale price, profit, all of these, the different lead sources that led to sales, month of sales, years of sales. We have all this data. However, we don't have any idea if it's useful or if there's anything we can do with it. Well, they come to you and you go and you plug in all of this information and look at this awesome information you could then provide to them. All right, so I went and wrote up some code for this. And basically, now what I can do, based off of what I know about the company, I can tell them that it is more profitable for them to sell to females versus males. I can come down inside of here, and in regards to which state is most profitable, here we have a state of West Virginia, 0.26. We have Ohio, 0.3. New York, 0.1. And we can say that Pennsylvania is the most profitable place we can sell. So already we know that it's better to sell to women in Pennsylvania. I can then come down inside of here and tell them that HP or Hewlett Packard products are more profitable. So we're selling Hewlett Packard products to women in Pennsylvania. What are we going to, what type are we going to try to sell? Well, we're going to try to sell laptops. Those are the most profitable. And what lead sources work the best? Well, we have 0.39 here and 0.40, and that works. Flyer 2 has been found to be the most profitable way to market to people. And we also found that February is the most profitable month to sell. And there's additional information on year. And also we have age ranges. And we know that it is most profitable to sell to the age range of 50 to 80. So with the calculations and formulas that I just showed you, you can see very quickly extremely how valuable all of these formulas are because we can very, very specifically target that customer that is going to provide us with the greatest opportunity to dramatically increase our profits. And that brings us to the probability distribution. And what it's gonna do for us is find the probability of different outcomes. Now, a coin flip, I'm sure you can understand, has a probability distribution of 0.5. You can only get either a head or a tail, 50%. A single die roll has a probability distribution of 1 sixth or 0.167. There's six sides and hence that's what your probability would be. And it's very important to remember that the sum of all of the possible probabilities is always going to be equal to one. You can also see the probability distribution here if we would roll two die. Now a relative frequency histogram is going to chart out all of these different probabilities and pay particular attention to the shape of the chart because Next, we're going to talk about something called the normal distribution. And a normal distribution is when data forms what looks like a bell. 
That's why it's called a bell curve. And in this situation, in which you have a normal distribution, one standard deviation is going to represent 68% of all of your data, while two standard deviations is going to cover 95%, and three is going to cover 99.7%. And remember from what we talked about previously, standard deviation is just going to measure how much your data is spread out from the mean or the average. Now to have what we call a normal distribution, the mean as well as the median and mode must all be equal. Also 50% of values are both less than as well as greater than that mean. And also you're going to have a standard deviation of one. That is in what we call a normal distribution. Now a standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, like I said. And if we calculate the mean, we see that we get a value of four based off of our sample. And this is the sample that we're working with on the right side of the screen. And if we calculate the standard deviation, we see we would have a value of 1.58. Now we're going to be able to turn this into a standard normal distribution by simply subtracting the mean from each value and then dividing by the standard deviation. And if we do that, we get the chart that you see here. As you can see, we have our mean value now at zero. And you can see here the process of subtracting that mean and then dividing by the standard deviation. Now the central limit theorem states that the more samples you take, the closer you get to the mean. And from looking at this formula, I think it becomes clear that that would be true. Also, the distribution will approximate the normal distribution. And as you can see, as the sample size increases, the standard deviation is going to decrease. Now the standard error is going to measure the accuracy of an estimate and to find it we're going to divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. And again notice as the sample size increases the standard error is going to decrease. And that brings us to something that is very powerful called the z-score. And the z-score is going to give us the value in standard deviations for the percentile that we are looking for. For example, if we want 95% of the data, it tells us how many standard deviations are, go are going to be required. And the formula is going to ask for the length from the mean, 2x, and then divide by the standard deviation. And this will all make complete sense if we just look at a simple example. Now on the right side of the screen, you can see a Z table. And if we know our mean is 40.8 and the standard deviation is 3.5 and we want the area to the left of the point 48, we perform our calculation to get 2.06. We then find two on our Z table, say there's two, and then we look for 0.06 at the top of the Z table, and we look for where those columns and rows meet, which is right here at 0.98030. So this tells us that the area under the curve is going to make up 0.9803 of the total. So now let's talk about confidence intervals. Now point estimates, which is what we have pretty much exclusively used so far, can be somewhat inaccurate. An alternative to them is an interval. So for example, if we had three sample means, as you see here, we could instead say that they lie in the interval of between five and seven. We can then state how confident we are in this interval. And common amounts that you would be confident about would be 90%, 95%, 99%. And just to break down exactly what that means, if we had a 90% confidence, that means that we expect 9 out of our 10 intervals to contain our mean value. Alpha is another guy we're going to be hearing a lot about, and it's going to represent the doubt we have, which is basically just going to be the value of 1 minus our confidence, or how confident we are that we will be right. And now what I want to do is show you how to calculate a confidence interval. Now we are going to need to do this a sample mean, 
we're going to need an alpha, a standard deviation, and the number of samples represented by the lowercase n right here. So there's your alpha. This is going to be your z table, or this is standard deviation, I mean. This is going to be your alpha. This is going to be a value taken from your z table, and this is going to be the sample mean. And this guy right here that follows the plus or minus is going to be representative of your margin of error. So let's take us through an example of exactly, you know, something kind of fun that would explain this a little bit better. So let's say we wanted to, we, we were going to get a new, a new job as a player for the basketball team, the Houston Rockets. And we wanted to calculate the probable salary we would receive as a new player. Well, to start off, we know the mean salary, which is a big number, 8978000 so forth and so on. And we're looking for our results to be precise to 95%, meaning that we want to have a confidence of 95% that this salary will be accurate. We're going to be able to get our alpha from this confidence, which is just going to be 5%. The critical probability is found by taking 1 minus alpha divided by 2, and we're going to get a value of 0.95 whenever we calculate that. And then what we need to do is look up our z, in our Z code in our table that we have here. And if we search for 0.975 right here, we find that the Z code works out to 1.9 and 6 right there. Then we're going to find our standard deviation and then plug in our values. And whenever we do this, we can find that our new confidence interval in regards to how much we can expect to receive as a new player for the Houston Rockets is going to fall between 2.6 million and 15.29 million dollars. All right, so good stuff and congratulations on that new salary. Now the students T distributions are going to be used whenever your sample sizes are either small or the population variance is unknown. And a T distribution looks like a normal distribution except that it just simply has fatter tails. And what this means is just that there is wider dispersion between the variables. And in situations in which we know the standard deviation, we can just go and compute all this information using our Z scores and our Z tables and use our normal distribution to calculate probabilities. However, we are not always provided with that information. The formula for calculating these values is going to be just our sample mean that we have right here the value we're going to receive from our t-table multiplied times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples minus one. And the number of samples minus one, as you're going to see, is very often also referred to as the degrees of freedom. All right, so let's go and use t-distribution with a real-life example. Let's say that a manufacturer is promising that their brake pads will last for 65,000 kilometers with a 0.95 confidence level. We, however, go and make some calculations and our sample mean works out to 62,456. We then do further calculations and find that our standard deviation works out to 2,418. Degrees of freedom is the number of samples taken minus one. So if we take 30 samples, that means our degrees of freedom is going to equal 29. And if we know the confidence is 0.95, then we subtract 0.95 from one to get a value of 0.05. And if we look up 29 and 0.05 in our T table, here's the 29 right there and the 0.05 we get a value of 1.699. If we then go on and plug our values into our formula, we find the interval for our sample. And you can see that that interval is going to work out to 61,693 and 63,218. The manufacturer is promising 65, and you can see that we are very confident that the manufacturer is incorrect. And in that situation, we would either just decline to buy the brake pads and say that the manufacturer doesn't know what they're talking about, or we would go and take additional samples. I'd like to now talk about the difference between dependent and independent samples. Now, with 
dependent samples, one sample can be used to determine the other sample's results. And you'll often see examples of cause and effect or pairs of results whenever you're dealing with dependent samples. An example would be is if I roll a die, what is the probability that it is odd? Well, I first have to roll the die to then be able to judge whether it's even or odd or not. And I think it's clear how those are dependent. Another thing you could do is if you could have subjects, people, lift dumbbells each day and then record results before and after the week. Um, that would be another situation in which you would be dependent because you would need to find the first value before you would find the value that comes at the end of our recording period. Independent samples are those in which samples from one population has absolutely no relation to another group. And normally, whenever you're looking at them, you're going to see the word random many, many times versus n not necessarily the cause and effect terms that we saw before with dependent samples. An example of this would be uh, basically blood samples are taken from two random people that are then judged or tested at lab A, and then you would say that they were going to take 10 more random samples from lab B, then you know that you're dealing with a situation in which you have independent samples. Another situation would be as if you give one random group a drug and then you give another random group a placebo and then test the results. I think it's kind of clear that both of those things are completely independent from each other. Now, whenever we are thinking about probabilities, we first must create a hypothesis. And I'm guessing you probably know what it is, but a hypothesis is just simply an educated guess that you can test. Now, if you would say restaurants in Los Angeles are expensive, that is not a hypothesis. That is simply a statement. And why is it a statement? Well, it's because it's a, a statement that you cannot test against. If, however, we say restaurants in Los Angeles are expensive versus restaurants in Pittsburgh, we can test against that. Now, the technical name for the hypothesis we are testing is going to be called the null hypothesis. And an example of this is a test to see if averaged used car prices fall between a value of $19,000 and $21,000. Now, the alternative hypothesis, which is going to include all other possible prices, so that means all used car prices are less than $19,000 or all used car prices are $21,000, is the alternative to the null hypothesis. Now, whenever you test a hypothesis, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true is called the significance level. And it, once again, is represented with alpha. And common significance levels are going to be 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0.1. And previously, we talked about z-tables. If the sample mean and the population mean are equal, then that means that the z is going to be equal to 0. And if we create a bell graph and we know that alpha is 0 0.05, then we know that the rejection for the null hypothesis is going to be found at alpha divided by 2 or 0 0.025. Then we can use a z table and we know that mu is going to be equal to 0 and alpha divided by 2 is going to be equal to 0 0.025. And what we would then need to do is find that the rejected region is going to be less than negative 1.96. As you can see here, 1.9 and 06. There you go. And the other situation would be that it is greater than 1.96. And what we're basically doing is just calculating this area inside of here. And because there are two sides that lie outside of the null hypothesis, this is known as a two-sided test. Now with a one-sided test, for example, if I say I think used car prices are greater than 21,000, the null hypothesis is everything to the right of the Z code. So in that situation, we would use alpha instead of alpha divided by 2, which is 1 minus 0 0.05 or 0 0.95. And in the Z table, if we look that up, 0.95, you can see that works out to 1.65.
Now, whenever it comes to hypothesis errors, there are going to be two types. There's going to be type one errors, and that would be called a false positive. And they refer to a rejection of a true null hypothesis. And the probability of making this error is just simply going to be alpha. Then you also have type two errors, which are called false negatives, which is when you accept a false null hypothesis. And this error is normally going to be caused by poor sampling. So just so you know that. And the probability of making this error is going to be represented with the symbol beta. Now, the goal of hypothesis testing is to reject a false null hypothesis, which has a probability of one minus beta, and you increase the power of the test just simply by increasing the number of samples. And I think this example here will clear up everything if you are at all confused. So if you believe that the null hypothesis is that there is no reason to apply for a job because you don't think you're going to get it, you could call this the status quo belief. If you then don't apply for the job and the null hypothesis was correct, you'd see that your decision was correct. Also, in the situation in which you rejected the null hypothesis and applied for the job and you got the job, you would see again that you made the correct decision. If, however, the hypothesis was correct and you applied anyway, that would be an example of a type one error. And again, if you chose not to apply, but the hypothesis was false, this would be an example of a type two error. And that brings us to mean testing. So let's say I wanted to calculate if my sample is higher or lower than the population mean. To find out, I'm going to need a two-sided test and the population mean is going to be the null hypothesis. And that null hypothesis is that brake pads should last for 64,000 kilometers. Here is all of my sample brake pad data. And we are going to calculate our sample mean, our standard deviation, our sample size, as well as our sample error. Now we are going to need to standardize our means so that we can compare them, even if they have different standard deviations. And we standardize our variable by subtracting the mean and then divide by the standard deviation. And whenever we do this, we normalize our data, meaning that we get a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, like we saw in the previous example. Then we're going to take that result and we're going to get the absolute value of it. Now, in the situation in which my confidence is 0.95, that means that my alpha is going to be 0.05. And since we are using a two-sided test, we use alpha divided by two, which works out to 0.025. If we subtract 0.025 from one, that's going to give us a value of 0.975. And then if we look up 0.975 on our Z table, we get a Z score of 1.96. Now what we need to do is compare the absolute value of the z-score we calculated before, which is 8.99, to the critical value, which is 1.96. And if 8.99 is greater than 1.96, which it is, we reject the null hypothesis. And to be very specific, what we are saying here is that at a 0.95 confidence level, we reject that the brake pads have an average life cycle of 64,000 kilometers. And this brings us to the p-value, which is the smallest level of significance at which we can reject the null hypothesis. Now, in our example, we found a z-score of 8.99, which isn't even on our chart. Let's say instead that the null hypothesis was that the brake pads would last 61,750 kilometers. That would mean the hypothesis would be correct at 1 minus 0.99996 or at a significance of 0.00004. So here, the p-value for a one-sided test is 0.00004. And for a two-sided test, that would work out to 0 0.00004 times two, which works out to 0 0.0008. All right, so enough with the p-values and on with linear regressions. Now, we've been talking about things like machine learning and such, 
Well, basically, you might say to yourself, well, why do I need all this statistics and probability stuff? Well, basically, neural networks are going to be made up from huge data sets that are very, very hard to work with. And we can statistically calculate outputs based off of our sample inputs. If we believe there is a linear relationship between two different types of data, meaning as one increases, so does the other. And in those situations, we can make predictions. And quite simply, linear regression is just looking at samples and fitting a line to those samples. Now we do this like we do with any linear equation. We find the slope and then we find BO in this situation, which is going to represent our y-intercept or where our line intercepts the y-axis. And basically, we are averaging the sample points to our line. And this specifically is called the regression line. And we are specifically going to say that this is a regression line by using y hat instead of the symbol y. And here is the basic formula for calculating b1. What we need to do is sum all values of x minus their means and the same for all the values of y. And then we square the results to eliminate any possible negative values. And then after that, we divide by the sum of x minus the mean again and square that value. And in that situation, we would have our slope for our line. And then quite simply after we have that, we can calculate our y-intercept down here by just plugging in our slope and solving for x and y. So in this situation, what I wanna do now is I wanna provide an example of how a linear regression can be useful and how it can analyze data. So what I have here is I have temperatures, average temperatures per month, and the number of sales of ice cream on those individual months. And what I want to do is my null hypothesis is as the temperature rises and falls across the course of the year, that the number of ice creams increases as it gets hotter and decreases as it gets colder. So I want to test that and regression is a great way to do that. So I'm going to get my means for X and Y because I need that for our little formula here. I'm going to sum the product of each value of X minus the mean and do the same for each of the values of Y. And then I am going to come in and get the sum of all the values of X minus the mean squared. Then I need to come down and find the slope by dividing those values to get a value of 5.958. And then I'm going to calculate the value for our Y intercept, which is gonna come out to 35.56. And now that we have this, we can create the formula for the line, which you can see all the values for in the table on the right. So that's where I went and calculated the new values of Y using our regression line versus the original sales, and you can see how they differ. So you may ask yourself, well, how do we find out if our regression line is a good fit or not for our data? Well, we do that with something we have already covered, which is the correlation coefficient. Now remember that the correlation coefficient is going to calculate whether the values of X and Y are related or correlated. And we calculate it by finding the covariance of X and Y, and then divide by the product of the standard deviations of X and Y. And if the value is close to one, then the data is highly correlated, which means our regression line should have a very easy time modeling our data. So let's work through an example where we find the correlation coefficient. Well, first, what we're gonna to need to do is calculate the covariance for all X and Y values, which is going to equal 1,733. And then now that we have the covariance, we can divide it by the standard deviation of X multiplied by the standard deviation of Y. And whenever we do that, we get a value of 0.9618. And since 0.9618 is so extremely close to one, we know that our linear regression line will very, very tightly match our data. And now I wanna talk about the coefficient of determination. Now, there are numerous calculations involved in creating a regression line like I think you saw there in the previous example. 
Meanwhile, however, I think you can definitely agree that it takes seconds and zero to no thought to calculate the mean line. You can see here is the mean line, which is just simply 400. So our big question here is, is it worth it to go through the hassle of calculating this regression line versus just simply barely thinking and getting our mean line? Well, basically the coefficient of determination is going to tell us. Now the coefficient of determination is going to be calculated as a percentage. And what we need to do is to calculate the sum of the square errors between the mean and the sample points. And basically what we do is we build a square from the points to the mean line. So all these individual squares that we have here, and these would be the mean line squares and they have to be perfect squares. And then what we're also going to do is create squares from the regression line to all of our sample points. So you can see the black squares represent the areas that we're going to calculate in regards to the difference between the samples and our regression line. What we can do then is sum the areas of the squares for both, subtract, and then find out how much area we eliminated with our regression line. So for example, let's say the sum of the square areas for the mean line works out to 1000. And again, let's say the sum of areas for the regression line works out to be 150. We can then calculate that 85% of the error is eliminated whenever we calculate the regression line. And I think it is quite clear now that yes, it makes sense to take the time to calculate the regression line. Now the root mean squared deviation is the measure of the differences between sample points and our regression line. And we are using all of these formulas, just to be quite clear here, to better understand how well our regression linear equation is estimating our data versus the alternatives that are very often much easier to come upon. So we find the residual for each of our different data points. So that just means the difference between our regression, this line right here, the residual, all right? And that's going to be represented with the letter E. So it just shows the distance from the sample point to the actual regression line. And then what we're going to do is take the sum of all the residuals squared and then divided by the total number of samples minus one. And on the right side of the screen, we have the table with both the samples and the regression line. So what I'm gonna do is find the root mean squared deviation. Now, if I calculate E by subtracting the value of my regression line from the sample Y, I then square all those values and find their result or their sum. I then divide by the number of samples minus one and then find the square root. And if I do all of that, I get a final root mean squared deviation of 28.86. And what that means is for one standard deviation, which makes up for 68% of all my samples, our regression line will be off at most plus or minus 28.86. And we could then add as well as subtract 28.86 and create two more lines that will capture 68% of all the possible values. And we could even go further and add in another line on the top and the bottom and capture 95% of all the different points. All right, and we are getting very close to covering everything. So what I wanna do now is finish up by talking about chi-square tests. However, it's important to know that before you can perform the tests, you must meet the conditions that the data must be random, the data must be large, and what they mean by that is each cell must have a value greater than five, and that your data must be independent, which means that you either use sample with replacement or you target 10% or less of the population. And I talked about sample with replacement in the probability tutorial series, so check that out. Basically, it just means that if you're sampling from the, the population, that after you take a sample, you then put that person or that thing back in to potentially get picked again. All right, that's all it basically means.
So basically, this chi-square test of homogeny is going to be used whenever you want to look at the relationship between different categories of variables. And this is mainly used whenever you sample from two groups and want to compare their probability distributions. Now, what we are trying to find is if age has an effect on people's preferences for a favorite sport. Our null hypothesis is that age doesn't affect the favorite sport. And the alternative, of course, is that the age does affect. So if we calculate the percentages for all columns, we get those results. And now to prove that the null hypothesis is indeed true, we should expect that 25% of 18 to 29 year olds should prefer the NBA, for example. Also, the percentages should work out for all other sports organizations. And the easiest way to calculate the expected value for each cell in the chart is to multiply the cell column value, which would be 35 in this situation if we're working on this value, by the row total, which would be 66, and then divide by the total number of people that were sampled, which would be 142. So if we do this, I can have an expected value for 18 to 29 year olds that like the NBA to work out to 66 times 35 divided by 142 or 16.3. And you can see how I rounded these different values around here. And I basically just calculated this expected value for each of those cells based off of age and the different sports teams. And you can see that the row column totals are still going to be the same. And the chi-square formula is going to be found right over here, which is basically observed minus expected squared, the sum of those values divided by expected. And if we perform this calculation, we get a final value of 7.28. And the larger this value, the more likely these values are going to affect each other, which means our null hypothesis is true. And we're going to look up these values in what is called a chi-square table. But first, we have to also calculate the degrees of freedom. And the way we get that is to multiply the number of columns minus 1 by the number of rows minus 1. So we can see 4 minus 1 is 3 times 2 minus 1 is 1, which gives us a final degree of freedom value of 3. And then we jump over and get our chi-square table, and we find our degrees of freedom and the closest match to 7.28. And whenever we do that, we find that we have between a 90 to 95% confidence that age does not affect a person's favorite sport. Okay, so there you go, guys. That is a rundown of just about everything you're going to learn about statistics. And if you combine it with my probability tutorial, probabilities out of an average textbook with examples for a whole bunch more. Hopefully you guys found this useful. If you actually made it to the end of the tutorial, please leave me a comment. I would greatly appreciate it. And like always, please leave your questions and comments down below. Otherwise, till next time.